Welcome, on behalf of the large and always growing Lantos Brood and the Tom Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, it is with gratitude and respect that we thank you each for being here today. We are so grateful for the effort and the support and the conviction that brings you here to support the mission of the foundation, which is to really carry on the work that my father established when he came to Congress by um, making human rights the focus of his mission. Um, when I am, um, when, when I was very young, my father used to tell me, when I, am, when I am no longer here, you will remember your Didi. And in fact, it is true, he used to say that to me all the time, you will remember your Didi. I will say that in these times that we face, I remember my father every day. And I wish his voice was still with us. He had such an extraordinary way of responding to tyranny, to incivility, to xenophobia, to American firsters. I remember my father telling me about the early American firsters, and not very happily, who were people who didn't want the US to enter World War II. I'm sure they had some good reasons they felt, but my father always felt that America need was at its best when it was exerting its moral as well as economic and political leadership in the world. And I know that each one of you here believes that and that is what brings you here to support the mission that I must congratulate my sister for carrying forward because my sister Katrina has truly worked tirelessly to build this foundation and to give it a voice that can in some way replicate the voice that my father had. And I'm very grateful to her for that work. Um, as I was reflecting on the few thoughts I'd share with you, I thought about some of the things I remember most vividly that my father used to share with us, sometimes repeatedly. I'm sure you've all heard about the Lantos dinner table where every night we enjoyed absolutely gourmet meals prepared single-handedly by my wonderful mother. We, we were sometimes sous chef, but my mother every night made an incredible gourmet foodie, worthy of any foodie meal. And my father enjoyed it, and, but he used it as a platform for very lively political discussions. And sometimes we, dis we discussed um, the cur current events, but sometimes we discuss more overarching issues. And I remember that um, one day my father, um, excuse me, my father told me that it was very important oh, what was that? Um, that, oh, I'm so sorry, there were three issues. Well, I'll start with the first one. The first one everybody knows. The first one was when he took um, a pen and drew on the napkin. He said, this is what I want you to understand. There are concentric circles, and it is very important that you serve, first of all, you take care of yourself, then that you take care of your family, then that you are involved in your community, next that you are involved and active in the work of this nation, and finally that you feel a commitment to the world. And I will say he modeled that very well for us. Um, he also, I'm so sorry, I can't believe that I, um, was fond of <laughs> reminding us that he had a great admiration for those who demonstrated what he called noblesse oblige. He explained to us that noblesse oblige was when people who really had it all decided that rather than kicking back and enjoying their lives alone and doing whatever they could, they would devote themselves to public service. And my father had a great admiration for people who did that. And though my father was certainly was not someone who had it all, he was never wealthy or had high social standing, he truly had came to this world with a sense of nobility and a deep desire to give to others, to his family and to to those who he knew were less fortunate. And in that way, 
he modeled for us something that is very important and that today I think we, we really were able to remember as we, we said goodbye to President George Bush, who truly he modeled that and, and taught that to his family as well. Um, one of the things my father did before he came to Congress, which you may not know about, was that he set up an international study abroad program for the university students at the California State University system. And um, every, he took it very personally, and every year before they left, he um, had an orientation. And um, he would tell those students before they left, he would quote Robert Frost, and he would say, as they were heading out, most of them had never even traveled beyond their state, let alone um, abroad before. He'd say, the woods of Europe are lovely, dark, and deep, but don't forget you have promises to keep and miles to go before you sleep. Miles to go before you sleep. Because he wanted them to remember that they weren't sent out just to have fun, but to come back and to contribute from what they'd learn. Um, I think that today my father would want us to remember that this world is so full of distractions, many distractions, and it is so important that we remember that we were not sent here just to make merry and be distracted, but to give back, and I know that that is why you are each here, to give back and to try to help make this world a better place for so many people who at this time are suffering in ways, uh, in suffering tyranny, the, um, the aftermath of xenophobia and so many different, um, unfortunately very regressive things that have emerged. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for being here. Please have a wonderful evening and know how much we appreciate the effort and commitment this represents on your part. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a few evenings in our lives when we have the opportunity to dine with heroes, to hear from icons, and to touch hands that have shaped history. Tonight is such an evening. We come together to honor the audacity and resolution of women and men, many seated at our tables, many more standing beyond this room, shackled in prisons or masked in mud and mire, often of state-imposed obscurity. Wherever they are, they serve as uncommon examples of courage. They have pledged their lives and honor in defense of rights that are the common heritage of us all but that are routinely denied to millions of our brothers and sisters. We come together to mark the sacred sacrifice embodied in their work, to redress this wrong, and perhaps more importantly, to recommit ourselves as we uphold the shared legacy, an obligation that binds us to each other. Before we begin our program this evening, we want to pay tribute to a man who led the United States at a time when millions in the former Soviet bloc regained their freedom and offered an enduring example of decency and duty in American public life. Please rise and join me in a moment of silence as we honor the memory of President George Herbert Walker Bush. Thank you. For the last 10 years, the Lantos Foundation has played a vital role in the global struggle for human rights. If you are in this room, you've been a part of that struggle. And we cannot thank you, all of you, enough for everything you have done to help advance the rule of law, to uphold religious freedom, to promote corporate responsibility, and to carry on the work that is our common inheritance. For those of you who know him or knew him, and this is a very high bar, I feel confident in saying that my grandfather would be very proud to see you here this evening. 
among the many, many extraordinary leaders joining us, we wanted to recognize a few special guests. Founding members of the Lantos Foundation Board, Ambassador Richard Sweat, also a former congressman, and Phil and Rose Friedman. From the diplomatic corps, Ambassador and Mrs. Wolfgang Waldner of Austria, Ambassador Timhomir Stoyevich of Bulgaria, Ambassador Henrik Bramson Hahn of Denmark, Helene Baker of the Netherlands, Ambassador Reika Semerkeni, Ambassador Ira Foreman, Ambassador Bob and Dr. K. King, who I should note are institutions in their own right in the Lantos firmament, Ambassador Alex Alexandra Hall, Ambassador Elizabeth Bagley, Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook, and from Congress, uh, she will be joining us shortly, but the next speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, Congressman David Cicilline, Congressman Ra uh, Randy Hultgren, Congresswoman Jackie Speer, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, Congressman Hank Johnson, Congressman Jim McGovern, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, and my grandfather's dear friends, former Congressman Don Bonkers and Chris Shays. We have foreign legislators who have come uh, to the United States, some for this occasion. James To from the Legislative Council of Hong Kong, and my dear friend, Maritia Schake from the European Parliament, and it should be noted an alum of the Lantos office. And then major sponsors of tonight's gala, Marjorie and Steve Kraus, Andrew Duncan, Barb Levy, Eric and Elena Wolf, Judith Siegel, and past recipients of the Lantos Prize, Rabia Kadir, Cheng Gua Cheng, Paul Rusesa Bagina, and the many representatives joining us from the office of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So please join me in a round of applause for all of our remarkable guests. You'll And now that you have met a few of your table mates and we'll meet more throughout the evening, we wanna share a brief film about the work of the Lantos Foundation over the last decade. And then we'll hear from the one and only Katrina Lantos Sweat, the president of the Lantos Foundation. Before he died, with great dignity, he gathered our family together and emphatically told us he had given his all for his family, for his country, and for his causes. And then he exhorted us to do the same. It is to advance the noble cause of human rights that the Lantos Foundation was established. Our mission is to strengthen and uphold the role of human rights in American foreign policy. Sometimes, admittedly, this is easier said than done. Because standing up for those whose rights are being trampled usually offends the tramplers. Tom Lantos believed that American leadership in opposition to human rights abuses, not silence, is the truest expression of our national character. His voice was among the clearest and most persuasive in our country, urging Americans to experience assaults on anyone's dignity as an assault on our own conscience. Who can know how many seekers of justice and human rights will suffer persecution destruction or even death at the hands of dictators if we are idle even for just one moment. We must not only remember the atrocities of the fascists, but also recognize that today authoritarianism is firmly entrenched And that is one reason why countries like China are so eager 
to create this information prison, to cut people off from the knowledge of what their fellow citizens are doing, of what's happening outside, of the criticism of their government, of what's happened in the past, of all of that information. Because that sort of knowledge is what, where people find the courage and the strength to say no. I will not put up with this. I am going to take a stand. I'm willing to take this risk. Simply stated, people want the freedom to practice or to not practice any religion according to the dictates of conscience. You and six others have signed a letter to the Saudi embassy offering to take 100 lashes apiece. We do believe that our letter and the attention that it has elicited has played a role in the fact that in the five weeks since Rafe was first lashed in this outrageous and brutal sentence he received, um, he has not been lashed again. We subsequently posted a, a petition uh, on change.org what made our petition on behalf of Rafe a little different is we actually asked people not to sign it unless they too felt that they were prepared to follow through. When we allow anti-Semitism to take root, then our souls are destroyed. And that's why tonight, for the first time ever, congregations around the world are celebrating a solidarity Shabbat. It's a chance for leaders to publicly stand against anti-Semitism and bigotry in all of its forms. And I'm proud to be a part of this movement. I'm proud that Six ambassadors from Europe are joining us today, and their presence here, our presence together, is a reminder that we are not doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. And you know, there are many explanations for this prize fighter's stamina, but the only real explanation for this relentless life in the pursuit of peace and justice is sitting right there. And my mother was the one who, who sort of took that big picture and helped my father to understand and recognize that it's meaningless unless it is changing the lives of, of human beings, unless it's bettering their lives. Surrounding me are my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Be reaffirmed today and forever that, like Abraham of old, we choose goodness over evil, light over darkness, and we choose life. Thank you. Tom once said he was a humble worker in the vineyard of the enterprise to make this world a saner place. But we all know the truth, that he had a unique call to conscience, a permanent vigilance against discrimination, genocide, oppression, and anti-Semitism. As Annette says, he was democracy's staunchest defender, and that was the core value of his existence. This foundation really embodies Tom's spirit. 
And it's quite humbling for people like Madeleine Albright, my dear friend, and I, to know that secretaries of state come and go. But what remains is that profound commitment to making a difference in whatever position we find ourselves and standing up and speaking out for those who might otherwise never have a voice. Ladies and gentlemen, we face a huge challenge and political correctness, denial, surveillance, military means, it's not going to get us out. Appeasement is not going to get us out. We have to have a clear-headed confrontation with evil, because if we fail to recognize evil, we'll never be able to defeat it. I hope you will join me in doing something when we see evil, in confronting it. I hope you join me in being ordinary people who take every opportunity to do the right thing. I thank you all for listening to my words today, and I thank the Lentos Foundation from the bottom of my heart. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. We need to speak up because the bell always sounds for us. We cannot be bystanders. It's not enough not to be a perpetrator. You must not be a bystander. Good evening and thank you all for being here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Lantos Foundation. As Maria, the young nun turned nanny in The Sound of Music said, as she was teaching the Von Trapp children to sing Do Re Mi, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. And the beginnings of the Lantos Foundation, apart from my remarkable father himself, trace back to my amazing mother, Annette, and my equally amazing sister, also Annette. The three of us had the closest and most intimate understanding of the passionate and deeply personal way that Tom Lantos fought for human rights, and we surely took to heart his injunction to continue this task. But we could never have undertaken it alone. I would like to begin tonight by recognizing the outstanding team of the Lantos Foundation. Our fearless executive director, Denise Perrin. Our intrepid DC director, Candace Bryan Abbey. The rest of our small but mighty crew, Diane Smith, Babette Rittmeyer, Brittany Smith, and Jill Hadaway. Please stand up, all of you, wherever you are. This glorious evening is a product of their love and their devotion and their loyalty, and each of them have become part of the extended Lantos family, and I am so grateful for your work. There is an even earlier branch of the 
Lantos family that also needs to be mentioned, and that is the truly gifted congressional staff that made it possible for so much vital congressional work in the field of foreign policy and human rights to be accomplished. Many of them are also here with us tonight, and I'd like to ask them to stand also and receive your recognition. Many years ago, when my children were still quite young, I found myself traveling away from home on a very turbulent nighttime flight. It was bad enough that even though I am an experienced and frequent flyer, I wasn't sure we were going to make it. I began to pray, and my prayer was very simple and specific. <clears throat> I asked God to please let me live till my children wouldn't need me any longer. I didn't want to leave all those little children without a mother. What I realize now, 10 years after the passing of my beloved father is, that that day never comes. I don't feel that I have stopped needing my father, his wisdom, his courage, and his love. And I still miss him every day, but, I also feel his spirit and his example guiding the work of the Lantos Foundation. And in that sense, my father is very much with us and very much alive. As you saw in the video we just watched, the foundation has fought for those causes and pursued those initiatives that have furthered the work that my father did during his lifetime. Tom understood that in order for human rights to be lasting and not subject to the caprices or whims of changing leaders or governments, they needed to be enshrined in law and upheld by steady practice. Hence our focus on establishing and sustaining the rule of law. We fight for internet freedom and to tear down the internet firewalls that really are the Berlin walls of our day. We work for the reform of Interpol so that abusive governments cannot hijack an agency of international law enforcement to become a tool of harassment and persecution in the hands of corrupt leaders in Russia and elsewhere. And we have established the Lantos Rule of Law Lecture in partnership with Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where next week, the distinguished American legal scholar and public servant, Harold Coe, will deliver an urgently needed speech, examining the ways in which America must be a force for sustaining the international architecture that supports human rights and rule of law. And I actually invite you all to attend that lecture, um, although we'll have to let Johns Hopkins know to pick a bigger room. <laughs> As many of you know, my father was both a teacher and a mentor to countless individuals. And in that spirit, we are proud to have established the Lantos Congressional Fellows Program, which brings outstanding young academics, journalists, activists, basically rising stars from around the world to Congress to experience a fellowship program focused on deepening their understanding of the US Congress and strengthening their commitment to human rights. Not to brag, well, actually, yes, to brag, one of our most um, distinguished alumni from the Lantos Fellows Program is here with us tonight. She is a Dutch member of the European Parliament, Maritja Schack, and I would like to ask her to stand up also to be recognized. We are so, so proud to see one of our Lantos Fellows go on to, to such great things, and we're very excited that this program will be relaunched again in 2019. Defending each individual's most essential conscience rights was fundamental to my father, and it remains fundamental to the work of the foundation that bears his name. His commitment to this wellspring human right of freedom of religion, conscience, and belief sprang from his very personal experiences during the Second World War. As most of you know, Dad was the only survivor of the Holocaust ever elected to Congress, but his life began a world away from the halls of Congress in the city of his birth, Budapest. 
He was a young Jewish teenager in 1944 when the Germans occupied his native Hungary, an ally that Berlin feared was on the verge of switching allegiances. The German occupation became the, began the true nightmare for the Jews of Hungary. Ultimately, some 500,000 Hungarian Jews lost their lives during the horrors of that time. My dad, like thousands of other Jewish boys, was rounded up and sent to a slave labor camp outside the capital, where he was conscripted into forced labor under brutal conditions. He rarely spoke of this time, but many years later, his closest companion, who survived the slave battalion as well, shared this story from those dark days. The Hungarian commander of my father's labor group decided to burnish his reputation by compelling all the Jewish boys in his barracks to be baptized. They were frightened, they were essentially helpless and completely at his mercy, so they all complied, all except for two. My father and his friend, Nori Kerenyi. They were badly beaten for their refusal, and yet they did not comply. Now, from what I know about my father back then, he was not an especially religious teenager, although in the few letters that survive from that time, he did write about his belief in God, a belief that over time would give way to a more skeptical agnosticism. But I don't think it was so much his deep religiosity that made him refuse to be baptized against his will, as it was his recognition that his inherent and inalienable right to sort of possess his own soul was at stake. And he was prepared to pay a high price to defend it. Something within that young boy intuitively understood that if he were to allow this trampling upon his conscience rights, he would lose something of inestimable value. I like to think that the character my father developed that made him such a brave and bold defender of the rights of others began in that moment when he chose his integrity and dignity over his safety. The Lantos Foundation seeks to defend that essential human dignity through the annual Solidarity Sabbath Initiative. The Lantos Archives on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial with our incredible partner's memory. And through advocacy for brave prisoners of conscience like Raif Badawi, imprisoned in Saudi Arabia for daring to challenge the religious orthodoxies of that society. On this day of national mourning for President George Herbert Walker Bush, when we honor a leader of deep patriotism and unquestioned love of country, I am reminded of dad's passionate devotion to his adopted nation, the United States of America. Perhaps my father expressed it best when he announced that he would be retiring from Congress due to cancer. He said at that time, it is only in the United States that a penniless survivor of the Holocaust and a fighter in the anti-Nazi underground could have received an education, raised a family, and had the privilege of serving the last three decades of his life as a member of Congress. I will never be able to fully express my profoundly felt gratitude to this great country. This spirit, this spirit of love and thankfulness to his country made Tom Lantos one of the most thoroughly bipartisan leaders our country has known. And his circle of genuinely good friends included people as diverse as Jack Kemp and Tip O'Neill, John McCain and Nancy Pelosi, Madeleine Albright and Condoleezza Wright, and George W. Bush and Bill and Hillary Clinton. Dad's unique Hungarian-flavored brand of patriotism and idealism sincerely transcended traditional political divides. And while, strictly speaking, it may not have been about human rights, it was very human and very right. 
Earlier today, at President Bush's funeral, former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney quoted from a small seaside plaque that the Bushes have at their home in Kennebunkport, Maine, with the letters C-A-V-U inscribed on it. That acronym stands for a pilot's wish for the skies they will encounter as they go aloft, ceiling and visibility unlimited. My father was not a pilot, but he had a similar phrase he often used that comes to my mind now. Despite the suffering of his early life, Dad was a man of profound optimism and hope for the future. Whenever I faced personal setbacks, or there was a much more consequential crisis in the life of our nation, he would say in his inimitable Hungarian accent, don't worry, darling, we are just bending a windy corner of history. And right around this corner will be bright blue skies and wonderful possibilities. I believe that with my father's spirit to guide us, and with the extraordinary friendship and support of all of you, and with a willingness to never rest in fulfilling our duty to defend civilization's veneer, the Lantos Foundation, in its second decade, can bring brighter skies and more hopeful possibilities to our brothers and sisters in every corner of the world. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, shalom, peace, happy Hanukkah, happy pre-Christmas. To your excellencies and to all of the honorees, to the Lantos family, to all who assembled here, I greet you with joy. As been noted, we celebrated earlier today the life of an American hero. And so first, my condolences to the Bush family and all of those who worked with, knew him, loved him. And to the Lantos family, I want to thank you for having me. I want to thank you for keeping the love and the legacy and the life of your husband, your father, alive. On Wednesdays, I have on my Facebook and my social media what I call Wonderful Wednesdays for Women. And so I want to salute Mrs. Lantos and all the women of the Lantos family. <laughs> When I first came and to Washington as a candidate, a nominee for the U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, I was told two things. One, you're going to have murder boards, and two, you better know the Lantos family. <laughs> and I was so blessed and fortunate to meet the Lantos family early. And Katrina and I served together as she was the chair of the USERF, and I was the first African-American woman to serve as ambassador at large. <laughs> so I want to thank your father, your husband, for blazing the trails that we now walk on and for fighting the good fight. So if you might join with me, let us pray and bless the food that we've all already eaten. Let us bless it <laughs> at this time. God, for the life, leadership, love, loyalty of Mr. Lantos, and for his service to our country and to the globe, for the liberty he fought for, for human rights, we say thank you. We give you thanks for the light that shone on his life and the light that he was allowed to give for those who could not see the light at the end or the beginning of the tunnel. For the honorees tonight and the recipients of all that he did, we give you thanks for the values, for the vitality with which he served, and for the victories won and those yet to be won. 
we ask your blessings. May we who tonight have food and fellowship remember those who have neither food nor liberty nor appetite this night. And for this meal we're about to partake of, we thank you for the hands that have prepared it. And we ask, O oh God, that you might minimize the calories and supersize the blessings. We ask this all in your name. In your name we pray. Amen. with us tonight, some of whom have already been introduced, and very soon we will be welcoming a very important dignitary to receive a special award tonight. But I want us all to remember that not all of the heroes are going to be on stage tonight. We are so honored to be joined at the gala this evening by dozens of brave dissidents, journalists, and activists many of whom have made great sacrifices and faced grave dangers to stand up for basic rights. As you've looked around you um, this evening, you may have noticed some people wearing a small button that says, defending the veneer of civilization. These are our honored and brave activists representing oppressed communities in every part of the world including China, Tibet, East Turkestan, Russia, North Korea, Turkey, the Ahmadiyya community of Pakistan, Rwanda, the Falun Gong practitioners of China, Uyghurs, those who fight for internet freedom, and the people of Hong Kong. And furthermore, I would like to draw particular attention to one individual who is not with us tonight, but who we also wish to honor and that is the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. I would like to ask all of these dissidents, all of these honored guests of ours, those with the pins, and some of you, we may not have gotten your pins to you yet, um, but I'd like to ask them all to stand and receive your applause. Please stand among us. Representing these heroes tonight with a few remarks will be one of my personal heroes, Vladimir Karamursa. Vladimir was a longtime colleague and advisor to the assassinated opposition leader, Boris Nemtsov. He is the former deputy leader of the People's Freedom Party in Russia. He now serves as the vice chairman of Open Russia, the Russian pro-democracy movement. And Vladimir has the semi-miraculous distinction of being the only person twice targeted by Putin for deadly poisoning who somehow managed to live to tell the tale. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Vladimir Karamursa. Dr. Lantos Sweat, um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It is such an honor to join you here this evening to celebrate the legacy of a man who was as committed to standing up for democracy as he was far-sighted about what to expect from those who did not. Before coming here this evening, I reread the record of a hearing that was held at the United States Helsinki Commission on May 23rd of 2000 two weeks after Vladimir Putin's inauguration as president of Russia. It was early days, uh, and most Western leaders were still heaping praise on this energetic newcomer who would finally bring order after the tumult of the 1990s. Few and far between were the voices, such as that of Congressman Tom Lantos, who warned that Mr. Putin exhibits all the characteristics of a would-be dictator and that the defining features of his rule will be intimidation, 
and revenge. Again, this was in May of 2000. One can only wonder where we would all be now if more people had listened. Today, many Western leaders are making a different mistake when it comes to Mr. Putin. They denounce Russian actions, Russian behavior, Russian meddling, as if this is all being done by Russia as a nation and not by a clique of kleptocrats sitting in the Kremlin who have been abusing the rights of the Russian people long before they began to violate international borders. Congressman Lantos never made that mistake. He was never careless about the language. He never equated nations with authoritarian regimes that misrule them, as he would never equate his native Hungary with the thugs of Janos Kadar. And it is so heartening to see the Lantos Foundation continue this legacy. And testimony to that is the fact that here tonight, the nations of Turkey, China, Russia, Tibet, North Korea, and others are represented not by the diplomatic envoys of the despots, but by democratic activists who are standing up for the freedom and dignity of their fellow citizen. We are all deeply honored to be here tonight. We are very different. Our nations and our histories are very different. But what I think unites us, what I think unites us all, is the refusal to be complicit in the crimes that these regimes are committing supposedly on behalf of our countries. They do not speak for us. They do not act in our name. And when the day finally comes, as I know it will, when our countries have governments that represent and respect their own people, we will be grateful for leaders like Congressman Tom Lantos, like Senator John McCain, for whom defending democracy was more important than appeasing dictators. There are many women that my grandfather looked up to, and a good number of them are in this room. Uh, when he dealt with my grandmother or Speaker Pelosi, dis despite the fact that he was a longtime professor, the teacher quickly became the student, and he was okay with that. But there were frankly very few men about whom I can say the same. One extraordinary exception to that rule is Vice President Joe Biden. Vice President Biden was my grandfather's first serious boss in Washington. And no other man my grandfather ever worked with better reflected his commitment to country, to family, and to principle. Decades later, when I had the chance to work for then Senator Biden on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I learned for myself a truth that my grandfather would often whisper as I was growing up there is no better job in Washington than working for Joe Biden. At this point, I've made the rounds, the State Department, the White House, the halls of Congress, I can tell you it holds true. Vice President Biden is a once in a generation amalgam of grit and empathy, dynamism and decency. Few leaders in history have done so much to advance the cause of building a civil society, and there is no finer exemplar of my grandfather's values in American public life today, at a time when that example is desperately, desperately needed. Please join me in welcoming the pride of Delaware, a man who has served as the beating heart of the Senate, and the greatest champion I know for the rights of the oppressed, Joe Biden, and the woman who will be introducing him, a woman who herself needs no introduction, the next Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi.
Good evening, everyone. This is a beautiful sight to behold, people who shared the values of Tom Lantos, and now the person chairing our committee in the House, co-chairing it, Jim McGovern, who's worked on these issues so much. Thank you, Jim McGovern, for being here. To Micah, thank, to Micah, thank you for bringing us on. Good evening. Congratulations to the many friends and partners of the Lantos Foundation on 10 extraordinary years. We've been blessed by the leadership of Annette and her daughters, Annette and Katrina. That's an applause line. <laughs> of course, Tom's family was the joy of his life. But we also saw the great pride he felt, Mr. Vice President, when he became chair of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> when he talked about and there's no better job than working for Joe Biden on the Foreign Relations Committee, he may be stiff competition from being chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee <laughs> in the House, maybe. Every day, the Lantos Foundation carries on the spirit, uh, the spirit of our beloved Tom by shining a bright light on the dark corners of oppression in the world. Tom Lantos was the only Holocaust survivor to serve in the Congress. He knew the cry of never again means that we must never rest. We must never rest in our fight to defend human rights around the world. Tom made it his job to empower the powerless and give voice to the voiceless. Oppressed people were his constituents wherever they were, and their suffering was his cause. In the Congress, we saw his conviction, compassion, and courageous moral leadership brought America closer to its founding ideal of liberty and justice for all. But he wanted that throughout the world, too. Tom would always say to me, because I would sometimes just get so annoyed about the fact that we weren't succeeding as quickly as I would like, and he said, the fight for human rights is a long one. We must be persistent, and we must be patient but we always must make the fight. Uh, tonight, we have the great honor of recognizing a worthy heir to the Lantos legacy, the 2018 Lantos Human Rights Prize honoree, Joshua, Joshua Wong. I've had the privilege of meeting Joshua in Hong Kong and in the US. Since his student days, Joshua has fearlessly fought to advance the legitimate political aspirations of the people of Hong Kong. Yet, along with Nathan Law, who's here with us, and Nathan Law is here with us. Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. And Agnes Chow. Agnes Chow. How young they are, how courageous they are, it's just a joy to behold. Uh, but they, they have... Uh, Joshua, along with Agnes and Nathan, has faced incarceration, intimidation, and harassment for his peaceful, peaceful work to put Hong Kong on the path to a more free, democratic future. America has a moral duty to speak out in defense of human rights, political rights, and the dignity of the people of Hong Kong and throughout China. Tibet, people of Tibet, I was so sad. Uh, I had the privilege of bringing a delegation there to see what was happening to undermine the culture, the language, the religion, the people uh, of Tibet, but again, throughout China. And I have said in Tibet many, uh, then, and I've said many other times, if we do not speak out for human rights in China because of economic concerns, then we lose all moral authority to speak out about human rights in any <laughs> other place in the world. So let us congratulate, let us congratulate Joshua for, Joshua for receive, being worthy and re being recognized to receive this award, Joshua Wong. <laughs> We've been coming to these events over the years. My, how we have grown, huh? Is this beautiful? Really, thank all of you uh, for making this success and the persistence and the patience of Tom Lantos uh, materialized in this foundation. So when we come together now to have the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, 
receiving an award just takes this to a different height. And we're privileged to give the uh, inaugural uh, uh, Lantos at Legacy Award to a cherished friend of Tom's, Vice President Joe Biden. As a senator, chairman of more than one committee, Foreign, foreign Relations, as they call it in the Senate, and uh, then Judiciary, uh, and Vice President, Joe Biden has been a persistent, persistent, remember that word, champion for progress, a relentless advocate, un intimidated and undetermined, undeterred by the word no. Joe started, uh, stared down dictators and stood up for justice around the world, leading the charge to end the violence in the Balkans, championing the rights of LGBTQ people facing persecution wherever, working to wipe out the scourge of violence against women. He is our champion on that subject. and fighting oppression, repression, and abuse wherever they may be found. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Joe, for all of you, do, you have done, making your own record, but also honoring Tom's belief, the rights of one are the rights of all. You are a, obviously a very worthy recipient of the inaugural Lantos Award, Legacy Award, in receiving it, you bring luster to the award. And since you are the first, you set a very high standard. <laughs> and we are all, all of us who care about this, are grateful for all you have done to carry on the work of such an extraordinary friend, Tom Lantos. To many human rights advocates, dissidents, and democracy champions in this room and around the world, thank you for your courage. As Joe Biden's mother used to say, he was probably going to say this, so I'm stealing his line. Has Joe Biden, he, I've heard him say it many times, and it applies to all of you, the human rights to, to, to all of you. His mother said, bravery resides in every heart, and the time will come when it must be summoned. Mrs. Biden, we are so grateful for your courage, Joe, to answer that summons so that we can advance a future of justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Now let us watch a beautiful tribute to our, stand, our outstanding former Vice President, Joe Biden. In 1972, 29-year-old Joe Biden pulled off a huge political upset when he was first elected to the U.S. Senate. His unlikely victory captured attention far and wide, but it was the tragic loss of his wife and daughter just a few weeks later that would capture and break the hearts of a nation. The country watched this young father's journey as he took his place in the Senate and went on to serve the people of Delaware brilliantly, all while raising his two young sons. Tom Lantos didn't know Joe Biden personally then, but he was deeply moved by his story. As a Holocaust survivor, he knew what it meant to lose so much at such a young age. And he also knew how hard it was to pick yourself up after tragedy, to make the decision not to languish in grief and pain, but rather to use it as fuel for a life dedicated to creating a better world. Tom entered my life with a clarity as bright as those blue eyes at a time when things were not so clear in my life. And uh, he reminded us by example at that moment in my life that the antidote to tragedy was only one thing, love. These two men shared a background of loss, but very little else. Tom was a polished Hungarian academic whose worldview was forever shaped by the villains and heroes of World War II. 
Joe was a scrappy kid from Scranton, Pennsylvania, who learned how to stand up to bullies from a tough but loving mother, one with a lot of memorable sayings, the most famous being, you are defined by your sense of honor and redeemed by your loyalty. But fate would bring this unlikely duo together to forge a relationship that would last for nearly 40 years. In the late 1970s, Tom became Joe's chief foreign policy advisor in Washington, a job he loved. But Tom had political ambitions of his own. In 1980, with Joe's blessing and support, Tom won his own unlikely congressional race and began his career in the U.S. House with a powerful friend in the Senate. They traveled across the European continent together. Tom, in the role of a professor, regaled Joe with his insights and knowledge of European history and politics, cementing their shared commitment to making human rights a central part of America's foreign policy. And we went to the Balaton. I did not realize until that moment that the only fish worth eating in the whole world came out of the Balaton. I did not realize that everything, everything of value and consequence originated in Budapest. <laughs> I was unaware of that. The Bosnian Genocide, the first in Europe since the Holocaust, gave Joe Biden an opportunity to demonstrate the depth of his commitment to fighting for human rights. He went to Serbia to meet with Slobodan Milosevic and told him face to face that he would see him tried as a war criminal. This wasn't the first bully Joe Biden had stood up to in his life, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. Biden received some criticism for his bold stance on genocide, but not from Tom Lantos. His friend, and the only person in the U.S. Congress who had actually lived through a genocide, called and told him, keep going, Joe, keep going. Senator Biden remained one of the most dogged voices in Congress on the Bosnian genocide and his unwavering commitment played an important role in bringing that shameful chapter of history to an end. These two friends, now colleagues and brothers in the struggle for human rights, would climb concurrent and parallel paths to jointly lead foreign policy in the U.S. Congress. Tom as the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and Joe as chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Tom, who is more than 10 years Joe's senior, like the joke that senators were too old for foreign affairs. They just had foreign relations. He sat down with me. He educated me. He was older and wiser, and I sought him out. And I never, ever, 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 ever felt a moment of resentment as he would instruct me, instruct me about my strengths and my weaknesses. When Tom passed away in 2008, Joe Biden immediately honored his friend by naming the AIDS relief PEPFAR bill after him. This bipartisan effort has been credited with saving millions of lives. But more than this, Joe Biden continued to honor Tom's legacy by standing up for the values and commitments that Tom himself would have fought for. The prime obligation of every human being is to speak out against injustice committed against any other human being. And the more different that human being is from you, the greater your obligation to speak out for that human being. I was violating cultural norms, whether it was the State Department or other elected officials would say, that is a different culture. There is no justification in any circumstances to deal with people in an inhumane way. None, none, none. Not religious, not culture, not anything, not history, period. We've got to get by this. It's the measure of our humanity. 
As Vice President, Joe Biden faithfully supported activists and organizations around the world as they sought to hold their governments accountable. He never let an opportunity to meet with dissidents, reformers, and brave civil society leaders pass him by. He understood that these meetings were not only valuable in and of themselves, they also sent a powerful message of rebuke to repressive leaders and brought encouragement to human rights warriors in every corner of the globe. Joe's foreign policy expertise was constantly called on during his time in the White House. And he was a compelling voice arguing that a strong civil society is a crucial part of any vibrant and rights-respecting nation. At the end of his tenure as vice president, Joe Biden could have simply enjoyed a well-earned retirement after a lifetime of service. But that wouldn't have been his style. The path that Joe Biden has charted in the last two years has not been easy, but it's been a natural fit for the scrapper from Scranton. He's still fighting the bullies. In the political arena, yes, but also one of the greatest bullies in human history the cancer that took the life of his son, Beau. Joe Biden, a defender of human rights and a true American statesman. Your friend Tom would have once again been overwhelmed by the courage and conviction you have shown. He would have wanted you and none other to receive the very first Tom Lantos Legacy Award. Indeed, no one else was even considered. And he would have had one more thing to tell you as you look ahead and decide what the future holds. Keep going, Joe. Keep going. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the recipient of the first Decenio Lantos Legacy Award, Vice President Joe Biden. a distinction in the Biden family. My brother Jimmy, I wish was able to be here tonight. He did the best Tom Lantos impersonation you'd ever heard. But he would always talk about little Annette and big Annette. And, uh, and, uh, but Annette, mom, uh, you, uh, you and Tom uh, were just one incredible team. And I don't think that uh, Tom could have measured up to even the all the natural talent he had, who he was, without you there. Because what people don't realize, Annette went through the same thing that Tom went through in Hungary. Annette was, and family, was lost in Holocaust as well. She was as deep and bright and as much of an understanding of what it all meant as Tom did. And her support of Tom was incredible. <clears throat> Annette, you would have made one hell of a congresswoman, senator, governor, president. But thank you for all you've done, all you've done for so many. Folks, uh, before I begin, uh, one other thing I, I learned a lot from Tom. But the most important thing I learned from Tom from our visits to Hungary, and I learned that the Irish really were descendants of the Hungarians. <laughs> No, that was his whole thing. No, he talked about coming across the steps from China. I mean, you know, he talked about, anyway, he, he had this down. And I didn't believe it at first, but then I realized that must have been where we got the Blarney Stone. It must have been in Budapest. It had to be in Budapest. Although the Hungarians do it with so much more lean in class, the way they do it. But uh, I'm, I'm, you think I'm joking. Tom would sit down with me, I'd say, but Tom, that's the Irish of it. You know, Joe, that's really the Hungarian of it. This is how it works. It'll take me through. 
Annette, uh, I can't believe it's been 10 years. It feels like yesterday that Tom and I were sitting together uh, sharing stories, making jokes, talking about our hopes, our children, our grandchildren, and their futures, not ours. And uh, I know uh, you remember, too, Madam Leader, uh, the way those penetrating blue eyes would look at you. <laughs> you may not have agreed, nor would I, when he started off, but by the end of it, you say, okay, Tom, all right, okay, <laughs> all right. Madam Leader, uh, Madam Speaker, I should say, thank you. You've been my speaker. You'll continue to be my speaker, and you're just such an incredible asset for all of us. Thank you for everything you do. And I said to the family uh, uh, before we came out that uh, we Bidens, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, we owe the entire family for having shared Tom with us uh, so much, particularly in the 70s, when it was a particularly difficult time for my family, adjusting to the loss that we had. And uh, I would find that uh, Tom would spend a lot of time with me, but then I'd learn that uh, Tom would uh, buy gifts for and go up to Wilmington and take my boys out to dinner. And uh, they loved him. My son, Bo, who became the Attorney General, who I recently lost, uh, uh, adored him. And, uh, and my son, Hunter, is the brightest man that I know, thought Tom was the brightest man he ever knew. No, but I, I, I really mean it. It sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. It genuinely is not. And so I thank you all. I thank you, Annette. I thank all your children and your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, but m mostly your children for sharing your dad with us, uh, and, it, and it made a great deal of difference. You know, Tom and I, uh, uh, I, I, I learned of Tom through my younger brother, Jimmy, who was working in San Francisco, and he worked at the time for a guy named Walter Shorenstein. And, uh, and uh, he told me about this guy, Tom Lantos, and Tom wanted me to come and speak. I think it was a UA, UJA meeting. I don't recall exactly what, what it was. And so I was happy to do it. And afterwards, uh, Tom spent, uh, Jimmy arranged for Tom and I and Jimmy to go get something to eat after the dinner. And uh, I got to know Tom a little bit. And I must tell you, I was, I was truly impressed. And uh, I never thought Tom was a professor at the time. And he also represented, I think, the, uh, the teachers uh, of California. And, uh, but I, I'd call him from that point on for advice once in a while. And one day I said, you wouldn't be interested in maybe coming to Washington, would you? One thing led to another, and Tom came as uh, my foreign policy analyst. But more than that, Tom came as a friend. We worked together from the mid-'70s on in my office. But it's a misnomer to suggest that Tom worked for me. Uh, I had the great advantage of having a, uh, a, a mentor a tutor, an educator. Tom and I would have lunch together in the office, and I would just pick Tom's brain about so many different subjects. And he was so, and he also was incredibly, incredibly, incredibly bright and had a significant background in economics. And so we used him on the domestic side as well. And uh, when that crazy thing happened in Jonestown, there was talk about what Tom was going to do. He actually suggested that you go and run for that seat, um, but, uh, which would have been fine, too. But uh, I, I strongly encourage Tom to go and, uh, and, and make the run, because I was absolutely confident that Tom needed a much bigger stage, much bigger stage than I could possibly offer Tom. He reinforced uh, all that I had been taught by my grandfather, Ambrose Finnegan, and my father at their kitchen tables about the Holocaust. My father was what Tom would call a righteous Christian. My father railed against, he was a student of the Holocaust. He railed against what we didn't do, how we didn't bomb the railroad tracks, why we waited so long, why we didn't let, my, my, my father, it was, it was an academic and a practical focus for my dad. He could never understand why there was any debate about establishing the country of Israel. My dad was, uh, was a righteous Christian. And, uh, 
and he was really impressed uh, by Tom when I introduced him to Tom. The difference was I learned a lot from Tom, but the same lines, but Tom experienced all I'd been taught by my grandfather and father firsthand as a nethead from personal experience. And uh, I can't tell you how honored and how humbled I am by this award because Tom Lantos' legacy is mighty indeed. Ten years, and I still hear his voice in my ear. I really mean that, urging us uh, to move upward, reminding us. One of the quotes he used time and time, everybody kids me about repeating quotes, but one that Tom would use for all our staff was, veneer, the veneer of civilization is paper thin, where we are its guardians and we can never rest. Tom taught me and everyone else that the slogan, never again, was a necessary mindset to assure that anti-Semitism will not rear its ugly head again and do the same kind of damage it did in Germany and throughout Europe. He taught me most of all that silence was complicity, that the only guarantee that we would never, never happen again was to educate generation after generation as to the atrocities that occurred. One of the things Tom talked about was his concern in the Jewish community, that not as many young Jews were being tutored in the details of the Holocaust, that it was necessary to remind people. That's why I'm going to say something self-serving. Tom was very proud of me when he found out that as each of my children and grandchildren turned the age of 15, the first trip I ever took them abroad was I put them on a plane and we flew to Frankfurt to Dachau. The first thing I wanted them to see was to walk through those gates. Bo in 1984, Hunt in 1985, my daughter Ashley in 1997, my granddaughter Naomi, my granddaughter Finnegan, and this year my granddaughter Maisie's coming with me. Because it's important not only to see the resilience of human nature, but what I wanted them to see, what Tom taught me, was I wanted them to see as they walk through that gate about labor setting you free, and you see along the fence line those beautiful homes with roofs that are, were magnificent, and the pretend that people didn't know exactly what was going on, the silence and the complicity of the silence was important for my children to understand, for every generation to understand. And I might add, I was saying to Katrina, or maybe it was Annette, that the last visit of the many I've been there, the last visit, I'm worried, because Germany is sort of sanitizing Auschwitz now. It's not nearly as raw and as it exactly was the first time I took Bo there in 1984, or the first time I was there in the 70s. The bunks are more varnished. It's not as un, un, unruly and unwieldy. The lawn is cut. The gas chamber is not available, we've seen. Wow. Things are changing. People are trying, many people, I think, are trying to either intentionally or unintentionally forget. And Tom taught us we can't forget. Tom understood the responsibilities we all share as citizens. And he believed that it was our solemn, solemn duty to question and to scrutinize. Because Tom believed what we're all figuring out now, that democracy requires vigilance and constant tending. I think Tom would have been the first one to send me a copy of the new book, re relatively new book, written by two Harvard professors, How Democracies Die. They die from fair elections. They die as a consequence of the guardrails being taken down. They die because people think it's automatic that democracy will succeed itself. Tom saw the pull of evil in our world so, so clearly. He witnessed those profound horrors, as did Annette, in his early life. But rather than allow suffering to uh, shudder his heart or blunt his capacity to care, Tom made it his life's work to defend others from that same brutality. Purpose. Tom used to say to me, the one way to get through anything that's really consequential for you, that's, 
that's, that's devastated is to find purpose. Find purpose in what happened. My mom said it another way. My mom used to say, I remember I thought it was so cruel when I had to identify my wife, my mother, consoling me. She was a, she was a touchy-feely. She'd never walk by you without rubbing your hand across your face or across your back. I was one of those guys, not a joke, that everybody in my neighborhood wished my mother had been their mother. But I remember my mother saying to me, Joey, out of everything terrible, something good will happen if you look hard enough for it. Your job is to look for it. Look for it. Find purpose. That was your dad, I think, presumptuous me to say. That is your mom. Tom believed that because his life was saved by Roe Wallenberg, it must have filled him with purpose, that he was saved for a reason. Annette, I don't know how many times I had confrontations with Soviet officials over Raul Wallenberg, how your husband never, 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 never gave up on all the rumors and stories of hearing that he was still alive and still in prison and all that we did to try to track it down. From the first day Tom walked into my office until his final day in the House of Representatives, Tom was our most powerful voice in defending human rights around the world. Tom was, I'd like to think, I viewed him as the moral compass of the Congress. He was always first into the fray to speak out against injustice. And I was proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with Tom in many of the fights throughout our careers. Tom taught me, and I mean this sincerely, this is not hyperbole, taught me so much on our trips to Hungary, to Budapest, to Lake Balaton, the meeting with the com communist leadership in Hungary. Tom was the one who set up my first meetings with Refuseniks. You saw that beautiful picture of Budapest, that bridge, that old, old, old bridge that goes back to, I think, 11-something. I remember we were staying at a hotel, and Tom was t telling me that there's a nascent beginning of of entrepreneurship in communist Hungary. And I remember being driven back from a meeting by a cab driver, and as I handed him the money for the fare, he handed me a note. Would I meet him in the middle of the bridge at midnight? And I did. And I can remember hearing in that clear night these footsteps in the fog coming across and thinking to myself, did I just do something really stupid? <laughs> really? And he spoke broken, very, very broken English. I had great difficulty understanding him. But he wanted to know whether I could help get him out. And about eight months later, with Tom's help, we got him out. So. Tom's sense of obligation to refuse next, not only in Budapest, but throughout all of Europe, was intense. Tom, when we were there, took me to the oldest remaining synagogue in Europe, as I recently took my granddaughter Finnegan in the same trip. And I wondered why it remained, and he said he wanted, Hitler wanted people to know that what Jews used to be, what it used to be. Remember taking me to the cemetery, Annette, and seeing those tombstones that were so old? Tom gave me a glimpse of what it was like in the 30s and 40s, you know, and what he and Annette and their families went through. For Tom, there was no fight too hard to take on, no hopeless cause in Tom's eyes. You just had to try. My dad used to say, just got to get up. Just get up. No, I really mean it. Just get up. Never complain, never explain. Just get up. I know Tom, I'm going to say something very presumptuous. I know Tom was proud of me when I started on the campaign on the floor of the Senate condemning Slobodan Milosevic and his regime 
for the genocide that was happening in the Balkans. And the ambassador from Serbia came to see me and said, would you like to meet Milosevic? I said, yeah, I would. And I went over with a really brilliant staffer named John Rich and another staffer, and we met with him in one of these old, magnificent Habsburg buildings that were beautiful, beautiful uh, symmetry to them as you walked up the stairs. And I walked into Milosevic's office. And we sat in a small conference table at the, as you walked in, it was to the left, his desk was straight ahead. And he spoke perfect English. He had a PhD. He was a bright, bright, vicious man. And I'll never forget him, my asking him questions about what was going on in Sherbanitsa and so on and so forth, and Karadzic and all that was happening. He said, I don't control Karadzic. Oh, that's him. And I kept pressing. He said, would you like to talk to him? I said, yes. My word to this. 15 minutes later, here come to the step. This guy running up, overweight, comes in, sits down, sweat pouring off his face, and he says, Mr. President, Mr. President. And I looked at Milosevic and said, no control. <laughs> we sat there for a while longer, and he looked at me and he said, what do you think of me? And when he said that to me, the first two things that came into my mind were my dad and Tom. And I looked at him and I said, Mr. President, I think you're a goddamn murderer. No, I went on. I said, I think you're a murderer, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time seeing you're tried as murderer. Because I didn't know how I could walk out of there without saying that and live up to time. No, I really mean it. And I got a lot of heat, particularly from my staff, because we still had to go through checkpoints to get out. <laughs> That's another story. But, and I was really roundly criticized, but not by Tom. Your dad called me and said how proud of me he was. When as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, I, uh, I held hearings on anti-Semitism in Europe in the early 80s. It angered everyone. Why was I holding hearings about anti-Semitism? I was in charge of the expansion of NATO, my responsibilities in managing the bill on the floor. When I went to Poland, and there's a significant number of very patriotic Poles that live here, more Poles in Chicago, the saying goes, than in, you know, Warsaw. Well, um, I spoke because that was the time they were at, at Auschwitz trying to take down basically what was a shrine to Jews who suffered and were going to honor a Catholic priest. I happened to be Catholic. And so I spoke before the University of Warsaw and uh, said that um, if, in fact, they continued down this road, I would personally see to it they could never join NATO. And I was absolutely vilified except by Tom. No, it was all over the news. I, no one may remember that, but it was a big deal. And they didn't do it. The point is, I shouldn't have been surprised by Tom's support. This is the same man who once called Gerhard Schroeder of Germany, quote, a political prostitute <laughs> because of his ties with the Russian gas industry after being chancellor who told the Dutch parliament in a meeting that some Europeans were more outraged by Guantanamo detention than by Auschwitz. We joined one another, House and Senate, in declaring Turkey's mass killing of Armenians in World War II an act of genocide and passed the legislation saying it. Absolutely outraging. Mainstream foreign policy specialists in the United States in both political parties. Tom. Tom, like me as a 19-year-old kid in a different circumstance, civil rights, was arrested outside the Sudanese embassy in Washington in 2006 doing protest against mass killings in Darfur. He supported a leading supporter of democracy in Burma. That clip I saw for the first time where he said, the less like you are to the people being oppressed, the higher your obligation. It wasn't just about Jews around the world. 
It was about anyone being oppressed. He imposed additional sanctions on Iran. Tom stood up to tyranny and the abuse of power wherever it raised its ugly head. But Tom's passion for freedom and justice was universal. He knew that the only way the world would be better was if we made it better. It wasn't anything automatic. That's why before he passed away, Tom wrote a letter to his children and grandchildren. It was a powerful statement of purpose, not just to the Lantos family, but to all of us who love freedom and believe in the equal, equal dignity of all humankind. And he wrote in part, quote, never take your liberty for granted. You must always participate and enjoy to the fullest the responsibilities of a free society and exercise eternal vigilance to protect and preserve that freedom. He also issued a warning, and it was prescient. He said, in this country, there's a troubling signs that ethnic and, religion em and religious enmities threaten to erupt again in the United States. He said that in 2006. And today, unfortunately, we see all too clearly the backsliding that Tom warned about 10 years ago, the pull of humanity that he knew we had to guard against. And it's the work of citizens all over the world to engage in sustaining and protecting our democracies. There's nothing automatic about them. To never, never, never take liberty for granted. You may not always, and we may not always live up to our highest values as Americans, but we have always kept striving toward a more just and more open society. That's what Tom's memory, in my view, calls us all to do. We have to recommit ourselves to the unending work of defending human rights and dignity, even when it's hard and even when it's not immediately in our self-interest. Respecting the rule of law, honoring an independent judiciary, the separation of powers, demonstrating an unyielding commitment to the freedom of speech and freedom of press. That's a commitment so many of you here tonight have made, the activists and advocates and the dissidents who have been honored tonight, people like Joshua, who are receiving the Lantos Human Rights Prize, other recipients, passionate commitment to democracy and educational freedom in Hong Kong has led to the repeated imprisonment. He was denied permission to travel to the United States to accept this award. We're joined tonight by inspiring men and women who fought back against the creeping authoritarianism and human rights and violations. I often wonder what your dad would think about Hungary today, at this moment. In China, Russia, Turkey, Rwanda, so many places around the world. You've all had the courage to stand up and fight for those values that make freedom possible. Each of you winners in the past and of the future of the Lantos Prize, you are Tom's true legacy. Tom knew better than anyone that democracy can be messy and inefficient, that progress is rarely straightforward and without setbacks. He knew democracies have never been unassailable. That's why we have to speak out when we see this backsliding anywhere in the world, including in our own society. Amen. Folks, I come out of the civil rights movement, playing a bit part as a kid in high school and college and law school and as a young elected member. But when I witnessed what happened in a historic city in America, in Charlottesville, in 2007, I literally, talking to Jill, my wife, I thought, well, what would Tom do? Because we had all agreed, we, Barack and I agreed, we were going to let this administration go for a year, have a chance to set itself up like, like W did with us and like every president has done. But I thought about it. He would have never remained silent. So I wrote an article for Atlantic Magazine and entitled it, We're in a Battle for America's Soul. Watching neo-Nazis carrying swastikas, accompanied by white supremacists, crawling out from under rocks, carrying torches coming out of fields, chanting the same exact anti-Semitic bile that Tom heard in the streets of Budapest, that people heard in the streets of Berlin and all the German cities in the 30s. And what I learned from Tom is when hatred is given space to fester, it gives license to other, other lowlifes to come out of the darkness. 
to be legitimated. When its distorted worldview is fueled online, it spreads. And when some leaders assign moral equivalence between those dark forces and those forces in Charlottesville opposing them, that just pours fuel on the fire of intolerance. And that hate will continue to grow. It's amazing how we have to relearn lessons so often. Pipe bombs sent to some of us. Thank God none of our grandchildren got hold of them. Two African Americans killed in a supermarket in Kentucky merely because they were black. And 11 Jews killed in the synagogue I know well in Pittsburgh. All in one week. All in one week. Folks, our children are listening. They're watching. And the words of their leaders matter. Silence is complicity. Folks, we cannot remain silent. We cannot be complicit. I conclude by saying, and I don't mean this as a partisan comment, but we are in a battle for the soul of this nation. We have to recognize the trend lines are moving in the wrong direction. Earlier this year, the Anti-Defamation League published reports of anti-Semitic incidents that rose nearly 60 percent alone in 2017, the largest one-year increase since they started keeping records in 1970. It's not an accident. It's not an accident. Our leadership is giving license, giving license to this prejudice. And their most recent study looks at how extreme anti-immigrant sentiment and stereotypes have increasingly been incorporated into mainstream politics and debates over the past decade. Fringe philosophies, this phony nationalism and this perverted populism, these new isms that have popped up, philosophies based on conspiracy theories, hateful ideologies, dog whistles, words for white supremacy and the alt-right are being heard more and more in established sources, including among our leaders. So folks, we have to be careful to avoid the temptation to rationalize this. This is America. It can't be here. It can be. It can be. We cannot rationalize or excuse away or turn a blind eye to the acts of, that violate basic human dignity of men and women and children on this earth. So remember Tom. Remember his example. Remember his words. And never, 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 never take your liberty for granted. To Annette and the entire Lantos family, thank you so much for this great, great honor. Our families, our family went through a lot together. And Annette, as long as I'm alive, I'm here for you. So speak up for Tom's legacy. We have much more work to do. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.
We've had quite, a, quite an experience. I think you can all clearly see why there was no other option to receive the very first Lantos Legacy Award. And I, I know all of you, like me, will remember this night for many years to come. And who knows, maybe in a couple of years we'll be celebrating another big event with uh, Vice President Biden. I know I'm hoping for that. Um, and I bet there are a few other people in this room that feel the same way. As we move into the next very exciting part of our evening, the Lantos Human Rights Prize, I need to first recognize a very small and select group of extraordinarily generous philanthropists. We call them our founding humanitarians. And without their amazing generosity and kindness, the Lantos Foundation simply would not exist. A few of them are here with us tonight and when I read your name, please stand so we can all thank you. Some of these grand supporters of ours have previously received a small token of gratitude from the foundation, but some of you have not yet received yours. So a few of Tom Lantos's grandchildren um, are going to be delivering a small gift to you at your table. So I'd like to now read the names of these founding humanitarians, those who have made our work possible, I'd like them to stand and I'd like you all to acknowledge them. Not all of them are here, but those who are here. Uh, the founding humanitarians of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice are Larry Ellison, Leonid Nyavslin, Phil and Rose Friedman, who I know are here, please stand. <laughs> Bill and Karen Davidson, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, Eric Wolf, who I know is here, Don Arnal, Yuri Scheffler, who has a representative here, Lester Crown, Judy Siegel, who is with us tonight, Barbara Levy, another dear friend and supporter here with us tonight, and one of the sponsors of this evening and a dear friend, Andrew Duncan. Please join me in thanking them all for making our work possible. Now, I'm going to be calling Andrew Duncan up to the, to the stage in just a few minutes. But before I do, I'd like to draw your attention to an empty chair that has been placed to my right. Our 2018 Lantos Prize recipient, Joshua Wong, who you will learn more about in a minute, has been prevented by China's vassals in Hong Kong from coming to receive this distinguished award in person. Some years back, I was in the audience at the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony in Oslo, where Liu Xiaobo was awarded that notable honor. There, too, sat an empty chair, because China would not permit the only Chinese individual ever so honored to travel to receive his Peace Prize. It was a shameful moment for China then, and it is a shameful moment now. But we at the Lantos Foundation are determined that one day soon, Joshua will be able to come and receive his Lantos Prize in person. And we are eagerly looking forward to that day. Now, perhaps the individual who has done more than anyone else to bring Joshua's remarkable David and Goliath story to the wider world is Andrew Duncan. Andrew is a film producer, investor, and longtime supporter of human rights and global democracy. He was the moving force behind the award-winning documentary, Joshua, Teenager versus Superpower. And he is an indefatigable and eloquent advocate for those fighting for human rights and democracy in China. We will also be joined up here on the stage by the two distinguished co-chairs of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, Congressman Jim McGovern and Congressman Randy Hultgren. They are both worthy leaders to carry on the Tom Lantos legacy in Congress, and we are so grateful for their service. I'd like to ask Congressman um, McGovern and Congressman Hultgren and Andrew Duncan to please come to the stage now.
Good evening. It is so good to be with you. My name is Randy Hultgren. It's been one of the greatest honors of my life to be able to serve these last few years as co-chairman of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. It's been one of the most active commissions uh, that we've had, uh, and some very important uh, work has happened, and we're seeing some results, but also uh, so aware that there's so much more work to be done, and the challenges continue. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to briefly introduce Joshua Wong. You'll learn much more in a couple of minutes as well. But Joshua Wong, as many of you know, has received worldwide recognition and admiration as a teenager who dared to take on China in a fight for the democratic future of his beloved Hong Kong. Named by both Time Magazine and Fortune uh, to their list of the most influential leaders in the world. Joshua has become a target for persecution and imprisonment as a result of his determination to fight for a free future for Hong Kong. Part of Joshua's story was chronicled in Joshua, Teenager vs. Superpower, which won the Audience Award for World Cinema Documentary and at the prestigious Sundance Film Festival and is currently available on Netflix. In recent years, China has been slowly tightening the noose on political, educational, and cultural institutions in Hong Kong, despite a treaty commitment to allow Hong Kong to maintain its independent and democratic system while legally part of China. At the age of only 14, Joshua founded the, secular, or the scholarism movement to fight against the introduction of a program of communist indoctrination in the Hong Kong school system. Against all odds, Mr. Wong's tiny group of activists swelled to over 100,000 peaceful protesters, galvanized in large measure to Joshua's personal passion and his electrifying eloquence and oratory. After achieving an improbable victory in the fight for educational integrity in Hong Kong, Mr. Wong became a key leader in the democratic umbrella movement and one of the founders of the Demosisto Party, excuse me, the Ma Sisto Party, uh, which advocates for Hong Kong's autonomy and right to self-determination. So uh, it is so important for us to recognize and honor him and would echo our uh, brokenheartedness that he's not with us tonight. With this, uh, I'm so grateful to have served and continue to uh, grow in friendship with my co-chairman, Jim McGovern. You know, um, some people ask me, uh, why don't Democrats and Republicans uh, ever work together? And I always point uh, to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission as evidence that Democrats and Republicans do work together, especially on the, on the issue of human rights, which is one of Tom Lantos' great legacies, uh, this incredible commission, which is focused solely on uh, raising awareness about human rights and calling out the dictatorships and the, and the torturers and the violators of human rights all around the world. And uh, it has been a great thrill for me to be able to serve with Randy Helkren, who I have unbelievable admiration for. Uh, and he's leaving Congress, but I just want to thank him for his incredible dedication. Um, and, and my thanks to the Lantos Human Rights Foundation for the inv invitation to join you all here today. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. I had the, the great honor of being able to serve uh, with Tom Lantos briefly. Uh, and um, Vice President Biden mentioned that he had been arrested protesting in front of the Sudanese embassy. I was with him. And one of the great thrills of my life was I got to share a cell with Tom Lantos. Um, and, uh, but uh, the one thing about Tom Lantos that I, you know, admired, and, I, and I, I, every time things seemed a little bit difficult, I think of him. Um, there was moral clarity on the issue of human rights. Uh, there was no gray area. Um, I mean, and he drew that line very, very clearly. Uh, you were on the side of human rights or you weren't, and if you weren't, you weren't his friend. Uh, and, um, and I think he believed that if the United States of America stands for anything, we need to stand out loud and four square for human rights. And I, and I believe that very strongly. Now, as Randy, uh, and let me, let me thank the Lantos family. Annette, thank you so much for your leadership. Um, Katrina, Annette, I mean, the, the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, I, mean, I mean, this is, I mean, you are not only carrying on Tom's legacy, but it, I mean, you're a force. Uh, and um, I'm really in awe 
uh, of the work that you do. But as Randy mentioned, that Joshua is not here this evening, uh, and we are all very sad about that. I mean, Joshua Wong, who led major student protests against Beijing in 2014, was sentenced in January of 2018 to three months in prison for his role in leading the demonstrations. He is appealing the conviction and is currently out on bail. As a condition of his bail, he had to surrender his passport to the court. And documents show the court has denied his request to travel to the United States to receive this Lantos Prize tonight. So accepting on his behalf will be his friends and his colleagues and fellow activists, Nathan Law and Agnes Chow. These two wonderful young activists are important figures in their own right in the Hong Kong democracy movement. Nathan and Agnes co-founded uh, Democisto Party uh, with Joshua and have been on the front lines of the democracy fight since the Occupy Central movement began. Nathan was elected to Hong Kong's Legislative Council in 2016, but was later disqualified from office by Hong Kong, Hong Kong courts. On what basis was he disqualified? Beijing chose to reinterpret the city's constitution insisting on more stringent requirements on how legislators took their oaths of office. Law's oath was deemed insincere, thus ending his term in office. Agnes Chow, who uh, represents uh, Democisto in a bid to take back Law's seat um, in the um, by-election in March of this year, was banned from the contest after an officer judged that Democisto's desire for self-determination was incompatible with Hong Kong's basic law. Together, Joshua, Agnes, Nathan, and their many supporters and followers are making history in Hong Kong. Their passionate commitment to human rights and democracy is exactly what we need in today's world. You know, I just say one final thing. Um, you know, Agnes and Nathan came by to see me the other day, and they came in to my office and they said, well, thank you for all the work that you're doing on our behalf. And I thought to myself, I, 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 it takes no courage for a member of Congress to speak out on behalf of human rights defenders in Hong Kong or in any place in China or anywhere in the world. We can say what we want and we're not gonna be jailed. We can say what we want and we're not gonna be murdered. We can say what we want and we're not gonna be tortured. But these people, when they speak out, literally put their lives on the line. And on top of it, they are young. I mean, they are young leaders who have the guts and the courage to take on uh, a terrible government that has no respect or no regard for human rights. And I am, it is us who should thank them uh, for their courage and for, their, for leading the way and for inspiring, you know, human rights defenders all around the world. Um, and when I think of them uh, and I see them, I think, our future is going to be bright. I think the future of Hong Kong, the future of China, uh, is going to be bright. So I pe feel privileged in joining all of you and honoring them tonight. And uh, before we, uh, I turn it over to them, it is my privilege to hand this program now over to my good friend, Andrew Duncan, who himself is a great advocate for human rights. And believe it or not, uh, we went to high school together. Um, yeah, I'm older. I mean, we went to the same, say, we went to the same high school together. Uh, but, um, I couldn't be prouder um, to have him as a friend. So, Andrew, thank you. Well, Jim and I are doing pretty well since we went to a high school where Abby Hoffman was at school with us, so it's a, a little bit of an interesting dynamic there. Um, thank you so much. I, I appreciate this opportunity, and thank you to the Lantos family. Everybody, uh, thank you so much for having us tonight. And um, especially to Nathan for coming and for Agnes for coming all the way from Hong Kong. It's a long journey and um, they're superstars in their own rights and they're worthy of a Lantos Prize in their own right. So thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to get started by, uh, I started on Joshua tonight. I'd like to take an America first or moment or whatever it was described as earlier and acknowledge three men here tonight whose lives have been turned upside down for the past two years here in the United States. Their only crime has been to warn that our democracy was being infiltrated by an adversarial foreign power. And I'd like to, uh, uh, acknowledge my table guests tonight, Peter Frisch, Glenn Simpson, and David Kramer.
Now I'm honored and privileged to be able to speak about one of the truly great people in our world, Joshua Wong. I read something on my Twitter feed the other day about guts. I'd like to share with you a guy who really does have guts. Joshua was a terrific young man who was robbed of much of his childhood because of his effort to save his beloved Hong Kong. Specifically, the joint declaration between Beijing and London. That declaration allowed semi-autonomy to Hong Kong until 2047. Beijing has not upheld the most basic principles of the declaration, as recently witnessed in the banning of a Financial Times journalist. Beijing's behavior has been so egregious that even booksellers and others have been physically kidnapped and taken back to the mainland, a recurring global autocratic theme these days. The last time that I saw Joshua was 18 months ago. I miss him as a friend terribly. We fished in Nantucket Sound, the same waters sailed by JFK, and Joshua was joyous and happy. We said goodbye that night. There was always this awful feeling for many years as to when I would see him again. That night, in a very rare moment, Joshua teared up. Contrary to his reputation, he, like the rest of us, is human. The young boy who fought for Hong Kong and nearly starved himself to death in defense of his city is a human being. He flew out that evening. A week later, he was on global news, going to jail. Joshua's only crimes were leading the peaceful scholarism movement to allow Hong Kong schools to have autonomy from the brainwashing of mainland schools, which he led in one at age 14, to leading the peaceful umbrella movement that merely sought to have Beijing live up to the promise of the joint declaration. Joshua, however, is also a metaphor for a much bigger issue. Joshua Wong matters not only to Hong Kong, he matters to every single one of us in this room tonight. Joshua represents the first domino in what is an epic power struggle between the United States, the free world, and China, or more specifically, the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese people are an ethnicity. The real issue is with Beijing and the autocratic Chinese Communist Party. So why does Joshua matter? How do U.S. corporations ever expect to get due process of law from a regime that does not respect due process of law with their own people? IP protection from a regime that steals our industrial secrets on a daily basis? Respect for maritime law in the South China Sea? Respect for a democratically elected woman president of Taiwan, our ally? And let's not forget genocide. Over one million Muslims tonight are being held in Beijing-mandated concentration camps. If our nation is driven to action on the Khashoggi killing, how about asking why Saudi Arabia and other Arab states are staying silent as Muslims are being held in constant concentration camps under orders from Beijing. Joshua Wong is the canary in the coal mine. The American way of life will be under assault if we do not push democracy. Like the heroes and heroines at Arlington National Cemetery, he has risked his life to defend what we hold dear and true. The Beijing issue is bigger than soybeans in silos, bankers looking for bonuses with Chinese sovereign wealth funds, Hollywood distribution, Google Beijing search engines and university professors trying to protect their visas. It's time to stop the Beijing green mailing of United States society. I will close with a story of this film in Netflix. Joe Piscatella, Joshua and I were told not to talk about Beijing, democracy or freedom ahead of the, Hong, ahead of the London premiere of our film. Reed Hastings, the CEO, of, uh, of uh, uh, Netflix and also a Facebook board member inked the China deal two weeks later after that showing. Joshua was not allowed to attend the ceremony in his honor tonight because he remains fighting for all of us. Our nation must come to grips with reality as many of our current leaders are doing. Beijing is an existential threat to the United States and the free world. Please join me in saluting a hero in our world, Mr. Joshua Wong. And 9.30, Joshua make his speech and we are getting ready for Joshua and us to reoccupy the Seafood Square. There's a moment that you thought, wow, we are gonna make some massive change and we are gonna make history. 
Joshua just ran off and jumped off from the fence. And suddenly, there's a group of cops. And then they just surround Joshua. When I was arrested, I met Joshua in the police station. I remember that he didn't have his glasses and he even didn't have his shoes. And there's some scratches in his face and he's tired and he's scared. I feel really powerless because nothing I can do, I'm still in the police station and I just hope every member of Scorism are safe. The scariest thing is that you don't know what's happening outside. You don't have information. The situation evolved very fast, and I decided that we have to uh, start the Occupy action earlier than planned. Joshua Wong and his generation took over Occupy Central and changed it into something different. And if you want to use the word hijack, I think it's not unreasonable. We are not trying to hijack the Occupy action. We're just trying to mobilize people, join the civil disobedience. The problem is Bandit High planned Occupy action to be a formal organized activity, just like holding a concert or a ceremony. But the uh, participant of social movement is quite organic. You can't force them to directly follow your rule, regulations. Social movement is social movement. Overnight, people started occupying the highway. And then police in tactical gear start showing up. People thought, whoa, the game has changed, right? This is completely different. It's just like the image of hell. Everyone was choking, trying to hide, nowhere to go. I just want to cry at that time because I feel really desperate. 
that I don't know what to do. They call their movement Occupy Central with Love and Peace. On Sunday, the largely peaceful protests took a turn. Downtown Hong Kong has largely become a war zone. The policemen always claim that they hope to protect the activists. But if they want to protect us, why they will hurt us? It's not Hong Kong anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we welcome Agnes Chow and Nathan Law to receive the Lantos Human Rights Prize on behalf of Joshua Wong. Thank you. Um, I'm Agnes. I'm a member of a political organization in Hong Kong called Demo Sister. And I'm also the friend and colleague of Joshua since year 2012, when we were in the age of 15. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Nathan. Um, uh, Joshua and I formed, found, alongside with uh, Agnes, founded the Demo Sisto in the year of 2016. And we are all working together to fight for democracy of Hong Kong. First of all, we would like to thank you, Lantos Foundation, for giving Joshua this award. Unfortunately, Joshua is not able to come to receive this award because his passport was due being locked up in the high court in Hong Kong as he is still having a court case in Hong Kong regarding the umbrella movement happened four years ago. But we'd like to thank you, all of you and all of the people around the world who showed their concerns on the human rights situation in Hong Kong and who, um, who have been supported the democratic movement in Hong Kong. Four years ago, that was the biggest, largest um, democratic movement happened in Hong Kong. That was the umbrella movement that Almost a million of Hong Kong people, a million of Hong Kongers, went out to the street and showed their anger towards the Beijing government and the desire towards universal suffrage and genuine democracy. We once believed that we could fight for changes and democracy after such a large-scale movement. Unfortunately, the Beijing government did not listen to our voices and keep on imposing suppression on Hong Kong people. And last year, a total of six of our lawmakers, pro-democracy lawmakers, were disqualified from the Legislative Council. It was not only the disqualification of six lawmakers, but it was a disqualification of a total of over 180,000 of votes and 180,000 of people's opinion. And this year, some candidates who 
were trying to get involved in the Legislative Council election, including me myself, were being barred from entering the election just because we advocate something that the Beijing government didn't like. And there was also a big issue that the Asian Bureau Chief of Financial Times was being rejected to get his working visa in Hong Kong and even was rejected to enter Hong Kong as a tourist. Hong Kong, was, Hong Kong is becoming more and more ridiculous in recent years. And, but Hong Kong people are still fighting very hard for democracy, for human rights, for political rights that we believe, which is very, very basic. The Chinese Communist Party is a giant monster that they are always trying to encroach the basic human rights of not only Hong Kong people, but people living in different places in China. And for all of you who are living in the United States of America, and for all of the people who are enjoying human rights and democracy over around the world, please treasure your democracy, treasure the human rights that you are enjoying, because it's not easy to fight for such a basic right in the case of Hong Kong. I really hope that Hong Kong will be a democratic place in the future. Although it's not easy to fight against the Chinese Communist Party, but I believe that Hong Kong people will still work very hard to fight for such a, um, the, a democratic political system. And um, I believe this prize does not only belong to Joshua, but it belongs to all of the Hong Kongers who are sacrificing themselves, their time, and even their freedom, that some of our friends were being sent into prison for over six or seven years. So um, I hope that Joshua would have the chance to come to get the prize, but unfortunately, he couldn't. But um, we will continue to fight very hard, and we hope that we, you would, all of you would continue showing your support to the democracy movement in Hong Kong and over, and the democracy movement in the whole world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for Atlas. And um, I hope all you guys could see this picture very clearly. That was a picture taken in the year 2016 when I was thanking my voters who voted for me in the, electoral, in, in the Legislative Council election. And there was, a num there was a number in the cards, and that is the exact amount of numbers that I get from my voters. I won the election in 2016, and I became the youngest ever elected member, legislative <laughs> councillor in Hong Kong and also in Asia. That's at the age of 23. But the oppression comes very quick, fairly quickly. In the year 2017, I was disqualified. I was unseated. I was expelled from the council with the most ridiculous reason that a regime could ever give, which I am not solemn to my constitution. And it was a sheer political suppression. But the more tremendous one comes next. I remember when I was in jail with Joshua just last year, just quickly after I, I was seated in the, in, in the Legislative Council. We were sentenced to jail, and we were, served, we were serving times together. And we both received a letter from the um, British Parliament and also from the Congress and Senate in US. And it was a letter of encouragement. 
And it meant a lot for us because we think that we thought that our efforts that we paid in the role of democracy was recognized by the world. And I think this encouragement, we we are not we should not be the ones who only receive that. All Hong Kong people should receive that encouragement from the free world, from the civilization. So when the suppression continues, I think it is very important for us to remind us that injustice and every, anywhere is injustice everywhere. Hong Kong is a place that the authoritarian regimes battling the democratic values. We've got our tradition of freedom of speech. We enjoy basic freedom and human rights, and it is being deteriorated by the regime of Communist Party. Hong Kong is a, just a symbolic forefront of that, and I think everyone who cares about democratic values, anyone who are worried about the revi revival of authoritarian rules, authoritarian values, leading by the Chinese government, should be very aware of what's happening in Hong Kong, because that is exactly the forefront that these two, very com these two values confronted. Funding for democracy in Hong Kong is not only the interest of Hong Kong. By seeing in, in this perspective, it is crucial for us to fight against it in terms of protecting our democratic values and in terms of also fighting for the rule of law and democracy for China, which is now the second largest economy. I believe that every single of you would rather to deal with a democratic second largest economy rather than the one that says, oh, they're fine. Human rights is just a piece of nothing for them. I believe that fighting for democracy in Hong Kong is as is important as to the Hong Kong citizens and to the world. Hong Kong may be a small place, but it's very unique because of its people. The people I met in Hong Kong made this place full of energy, and every one of them should deserve democracy as any one of you who are sitting in this room enjoying a full democracy of your political system. The sky before the dawn is always the darkest. I don't know whether it is the darkest now, but I think if every one of us hold our hands together, we can splash the light of hopes over the sky in the dimmest times. Thank you very much. And, and one thing I would like to mention is persistent, finding the purpose, is exactly the lesson I learned today from the Vice President Joe Biden and also the Lantos family. I really appreciate that, and I will put it in my pocket to continue my democratic movement. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, what an evening. Uh, I am immensely grateful to have all of you here with us. I will tell you I had prepared a long stem winder of a speech to close us out. <laughs> but my grandfather was a deep believer in the Geneva Conventions. And uh, any DC dinner that goes past 10 o'clock uh, risks being classified as cruel and unusual punishment. And so we will conclude, but before I do, I want Joshua, Agnes, and Nathan to know something. We will be inviting Joshua to join us next year for the Lantos Human Prize Ceremony. And we will be inviting him the year after that to join us for the Lantos Human Prize Ceremony. And we will be inviting him the year after that to join us for the Lantos Human Rights Prize Ceremony. And we will invite him every year until he has the freedom to take full part in this event. We will also be inviting all of you, because this work doesn't take care of itself. Human rights are not self-executing. They depend on each of us. And the efficacy of this evening's event will not, not be determined by the actions of Joshua or by the actions of Nathan or Agnes. We know what they're going to do. 
The efficacy of this evening's event will depend on what we do when we leave this room. It is up to each of us to carry on this work, and we look forward to joining with you in that cause for another generation. Thank you.